All right. Hello, everyone. We are live with uh, Lunch Zone. Again, continuing um, playing some indigenous games this month for Nash uh, Native American Heritage Month. Um, so what we're going to do first is read our land acknowledgement, and then we will introduce ourselves, and then we'll start playing Never Alone, um, and we'll, we'll talk about the game that was just actually inducted into the MoMA. Of oh, all yeah, places yeah, I saw this the year. Post on it. Yeah. yeah, that's great. So um, we acknowledge that in Milwaukee, we live and work on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, which is part of North America's largest system of freshwater lakes, where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinnick rivers meet, and the people of Wisconsin Sovereign and Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. Um, and you can, if you, um, want to head over to our Twitter, I've just posted a bunch of links kind of related to Never Alone on, on our Twitter should be right up at the top, including the exhibition in the MoMA where it is now. Um, it's in its own, I mean, it's not in its own exhibition, but the exhibition is called Never Alone, um, after this game. So that's pretty cool. That's awesome. You want to introduce yourself? I am David Kutchik. I'm a PhD student in English here at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And I am Thomas Malby, professor of anthropology here at UWM and those off screen. Uh, I'm Brian Thomas, a student of anthropology here at UWM. And I'm Luke Conkle. Uh, first time ever saying this on air, PhD student in anthropology. Yay! Formerly a master's student in anthropology. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, all right, let's get into it. I've never played this before, we're so. We're not playing Never Alone this week, right? What? Or we're not playing Growing Up with No, we are not. Thank you for taking that. I forgot to update that little thing. Um, so with this game, um, cultural insights are, are part of this game um, where you can kind of watch these videos. Um, these have been developed in collaboration with the Inupiat from um, uh, Alaska, right? Native Alaskan peoples. Um, there are, uh, there on the Never Alone website, there are 16 cultural ambassadors on their website that kind of helped out in um, creating some of these um, cultural insights and videos um, that are included within the game. Okay. And there are two new ones, apparently. Yeah, let's, let's just play this first one. Even though we're in northern Alaska, which covers this vast area from Nome all the way over the Canadian border, is that there is this extreme value of interconnectedness and interdependence. It's a hunting society, a gathering society, from thousands of years. Well, this is what creates our culture. That special relationship between humans and the natural world and the animals and that it teaches you how to have a, a society that doesn't do too much harm to the world. Love and respect for nature, for one another, for our elders, very, very fundamental value, key to, key to life. Our values are something that bind us all. The importance of sharing with one another, the importance of spirituality and the connection to the land our traditions, how we hunt, sharing of stories and songs and dances. I'm Inupiaq. I'm from the Oiti Golden. It's very important to me. It's who I am as a person. And you're very proud of who you are, and you want to continue that. Values. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Where did the where did the money for this game come from? Did you know? Um, I believe part of it came from um the indigenous community. Part of it did. I think part of it might have come from the Alaskan government, but I'm not sure. Interesting. But yeah, pretty pretty good production values on this. It makes me think of um you can play the game. It makes me think of, uh, you know, last week we were talking about how the educational part was in the game itself, and so, like, yes. it's got this different... 
Right, the whole notion of kind of the delivery of sort of nuggets of information, whether about the game or about you know something like a culture that the game is meant to introduce learning about, there's all these kind of different architectural decisions that computer game designers make and even something as contingent as you know the need for loading screens and some video games created this affordance right like like the spandrels of san marco right it's like there's this thing that just has to be there architecturally and then it gets elaborated and filled in with tips with something yeah whether it be tips or otherwise and snarky comments it becomes a <laughs> and then and then it becomes part of our our set of expectations for games so maybe even a game in a game yeah. where that's not architecturally necessary the game designer has the opportunity and, and a funding source for those games right like nba 2k 21 was using their loading screens to sell ads like <laughs> right and like that's right. you know like it's an ingenious uh, they t faced a lot of pushback for that but like nobody's playing during a loading screen anyway you know yeah very much of a shadow puppet uh style here right mm -hmm. um uh, much like the indonesian shadow puppet uh, theater and, and similar traditions. Is that um, indicative of like Inuit societies? I don't know, much about I don't know enough about it to yeah. say. I do know shadow puppet um, practice and kind of craft and technique traveled very widely, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't want to jump to the Make conclusion it that it, um, yeah. it influenced. Actually, there's a little video of it. These are all like a minute or a half. Well, that, so that's I'm, Scrimshaw. Yeah, that's that's going to be the carving. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, I noticed some like burning on, or it looked like, you know, kind of burnt edges on some of the things. Mm -hmm. I was looking, I was noticing in particular not only the kind of illumination and the silhouette quality, but the articulation of the limbs at certain points is reminiscent of the um, Javanese shadow theater. This is an interesting concept, this idea of like, this historical content being embedded in the game, but also a thing that you earn as you play. Right, so a couple of months ago, Matthew was playing Age of Empires 2, 3, two, one of them. Um, the newest version, Age of Empires 4, actually like has monetized, not monetized, but gamified access to historical videos, and that you have to like beat a level, and then you get to see like how crossbows made war different or whatever. Mm -hmm. So this this notion of like um, informate like historical information being a reward for in game play is right. interesting. Right. <clears throat> yeah, and like the if there is in game play in this game. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting, right? Because uh, in other games, it's like the narrative mm -hmm. that you unlock, right? Um, whether it's by you know, developing affinity between characters and you get to see their relationship go, right? Or just like completing a level, you kind of get to go further through the story as part of it. So in a game like Age of Empires, where it's really not about a continuous narrative, right? Ooh, right? Like ooh, that's a, ooh, ooh. Oh, oh. Or it may be a continuous narrative, but there are huge gaps between yeah. each like chapter, right? Like you're talking about like the English campaign, but there might be you know, a hundred years between any two levels. Whoop! Whoop! Oh, not as big a jumper as you are, clearly. See the fox in the background? I love that. I think that's our little fox companion. Yeah. The visual aesthetic here is really interesting. And is reminiscent of that shadow puppet, right? Like, they're still leaning mm -hmm. into that theme. Try single player. Yeah. Oh, you'll be plenty light on the ice. <laughs> yeah. You won't. There we go. Whoa. Don't Remind those of Zelda games. Like a dog that followed you around and 
Oh, the in the Wii one, there's the wolf. Yeah, yeah, you you can be Wolf Link. Um, in Not one that they're of they're at all related in any. Other way. <laughs> <laughs> it's it is always interesting um, having t- having to control two characters in the same environment. It kind of depends on the game and, and what the point of the game is. So speaking of Legend of Zelda, for example, um, Spirit Tracks, which is a, a DS game, you only in certain levels do you also control um, like the ghost of Princess Zelda. Um, in certain levels, in order to like move ahead, and it's kind of the same kind of puzzle thing, right? Where you kind of switch back and forth um, in order to solve puzzles. But that is obviously not a platformer. Yeah. Right. That's going to be more of like a puzzle adventure kind of game. Ooh. Gotta hit space over and over. I'm guessing. No. No. Oh. Hmm. Okay. A certain tempo, maybe. Maybe. There we go. Yeah. You're spamming too much. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of an implicit statement about the kind of the frenetic, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. mashing. It's a beautiful game. Yeah, I love um, the like the foreground and the background, mm-hmm. right? Um, the parallax of it, in a way. But yeah, it's interesting because usually when we, I think specifically, like, kind of the assumption in games is that you kind of have one body that's in a space, mm-hmm. right? And then you need to, <laughs> and then you need to, to navigate that space with that body, right? And I think a lot of game scholarship always kind of, even when we talk about, like, the body of the player versus the body of the character, right? It's usually always with the idea that you're going to be controlling one person. Mm-hmm. So then adding this like second entity that you need to, oops, then you need to control. Um, even if it's something as simple as, you know, a fox kind of following you along, right? There are other games where you can't like, the screen won't move forward unless you have both your characters moving. You, you know, you have to do them both simultaneously. Oops. Oh. No, no, you're dead. Okay, I'm gonna. Oh shoot! I wonder if it has to be pushed over and over again, or if it's. I think it's just down. once. You just have to like. Have, oh, that, oh, it's, it's the way you get down. Yeah. I see. And I think it. I think if there's a a constant time to the wind. Yep. Fox can't go in there either. Okay. It's still cold. He's got fur. It's still cold. Water. about the best levels of mine? <laughs> I guess the most challenging. So <laughs> if you're not trying to phone it in, yeah. It, it, but that moving platform, right, kind of like you were saying, Thomas, right, where the, the frenetic button mash, right. right, when platforms move, you can't just, um, <laughs> you can't just, you know, wait, press steam walk. Ahead. Yeah, right. you can't just do the full steam ahead. Yeah. Tempo, you know, in the social theoretical sense, right? Bourdieu makes a big deal about talking about it, and he's really smart to do that. Tempo in in games as a as a narrative resource, a resource for trying to con- more than just narrative convey Oops. the the disposition that you're trying to convey. It's, it's kind of cool to notice that in this game. And it also makes sense with. Uh, 
in terms of the environment, right? Where if you're in a blizzard, you can't just like, you have to conserve energy, right? Mm -hmm. In this kind of space, you can't just kind of blindly. It's not a kind of dominating approach, right? Yep. To nature. Temple's also interesting if we consider the like history that, or the impact that quick time events have had on the gaming industry, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and their anti anti button mashing technology in, in quick time. I feel uh, I feel like there haven't been a whole lot of quick time events in games I've played recently. Oh no, they they're largely not popular anymore, but they certainly set a tone. Yeah, there's a residue of them, kind of, in, in in games today. I think that's the impacts are still there, even if the mechanic is not. Whoop! Right. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like owls are checkpoints too. You know, you Ooh. could you could say the mechanic has gone, or you might say the mechanic has just been refined. You know? It's it's yeah. less obvious now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, if like you're fighting, uh, you know, a boss in Elden Ring. The tempo of that fight, right, could have been informed by, oh my gosh, <laughs> the types of quick time events, right, that that existed in games. I mean, the the from games are just such an interesting like lineage, <coughs> lineage of games because each the mechanics of each game depend on a different like success depends on a different mechanic, right? Whether it's demon and. Uh, Dark Souls that depend on like the evasion mechanic and like the blocking mechanic, mm -hmm. or, like um, the samurai theme game where like you have to press the attack, right? Like if you let up, that's when the monsters like get their. There is a super cool detail, which is if you watch the fox fox's tail, just before the wind picks up. It will f it will go forward as if there's a bit of a vacuum effect. Oh, oh over. that's I mean, cool. That is, that's real detail. That's really cool. Finally, we made it. I like this a lot. It's really pretty. The mechanics are like they feel meaningful. Yeah, and you you have to wait. Right, I think that's... Come on. Oh, maybe I have to press it at the same time. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh. Alright, here we go. We're gonna mm -hmm. unlock the... I kind of, I like being the fox a little more, just because I like I like having that light, airy jump to it. Mm -hmm. Hello, XLDM. Thanks for joining Whoa. us. Hey. Uh, morning and today I'm limping and not much use. <laughs> what did he say? Yeah, he fell off his bike yesterday. Oh so. no! Oof. I'm Ouch. sorry to hear that. He's, uh, he's got a bum ankle. Right oh, now. that was a heck of a jump. <laughs> you did that on purpose, Dave. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank goodness foxes have opposable thumbs. They're just trying to, trying to get ahead on the speed run of this, that's all. It's but interesting it's, that there's, there's obviously some sort of like stats involved, right? Being the fox or being mm -hmm, the player, mm -hmm. the human character. Fox can but, crouch. You know. Yeah, but there's not, uh, there's, there's no tracking, you know, you just kind of figure it out. Yeah. Can the fox brace, or is that? Yeah, I'm just bad at bracing. <laughs> <laughs> is there so? Is there no benefit to playing the human? Is I guess the question. I bet there. Were, yeah, I wonder if we just haven't seen that mechanic yet. Yeah, I think from what I remember, because I think Janelle played this uh, a couple years ago. From what I remember, is there are certain puzzles like moving things, right, or, or being able to that the fox just can't sure. do. There's something about this game that really reminds me of Little Big Planet. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Is that the, the Sackboy series? Yeah, yeah, the kind of co-op motion of it. The something about the way the jumps are done and the way the environment is done, the textures, the the ragdoll 
physics behind it. It's very, very familiar in that way. I like the kind of softness of this too. Oh no. Oh jeez. Oh my gosh. Wow. Seeing her reaction first was very powerful. Yeah. You know, this makes this with like animating scrimshaw, right? Like the the idea of like going from a two D art form to like mm -hmm. that, you know, to the I guess it is still two D, whatever. But um, but to the digital, uh, like I wonder what that process is like because I feel like I mean you can kind of be informed by how other two D art forms become animated, but like how do you I guess how do you conceptualize going from you know this art form to a digital form? Especially because the scrimshaw, actually, when you think about it, is 3D in several ways, yeah, right? Well, yeah, it's, it is. It's yeah. In, inscribed. It's also a curved object. You know, um, the way the light interacts with it, the way it's held. Um, you know, you're you're trading off a lot of those affordances for what you're how you're trying to represent it here. That's that's a real challenge. It's almost like. Um like translating languages through Google Translate and then translating them back. Or um, that's how they came up with like Yoda's speech pattern in Star Wars. Oh. Because they translated the script to Latin and then translated the words back to English. And so that's why like verbs are last and stuff. Um, I think the uh, choices about camera control are becoming really interesting as you notice them. There was the, we saw her reaction before we saw the village. We just saw the kind of lift with the loon head, like unnecessarily, you know, in a, in a great way to sort of take you up into that level before it came back down to where you could see the ground. That was cool. And there's a vignette around the outside that's sort of like the slotted snow goggles. The slotted what? The slotted snow goggles. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. So you get that shading around the outside. Oh, right. That's really that's a really good catch. I noticed the goggles, but didn't put that together with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, there's an introduction to what it, you know, what your visuals mm -hmm. are like, perhaps, you know, right? Oop! I should have just gone completely. Hey, that was pretty good though. You know, you cleared cleared it. There nice. we go. Wow. There we go. <laughs> well done. Oh. <laughs> I am so uh I'm just so not used to doing you know, controlling two people or two things, right? It's just XLDM says, and if it's drawn, it's also in motion. I assume that's related to the 2D versus 3D. Yeah. Part. So should I have to go back maybe a bit? Yeah. There. Ah. This is really, this is rad. I like this yeah. Rad. Yeah. Pretty it's, great. It's just beautiful. Beautiful. And it's really hard to, um, when you have a, any kind of environment where it's a very similar color all around, right? Like, it's sometimes hard to make that distinction between what's in the foreground and what's in the background, right? It's all shaded very well to make, make it really clear what you can grab onto and what you, you know, what you can interact with. Yeah. The language is wonderful. 
to hear too, partly because you don't hear it very often. Mm -hmm. And it highlights it. This is Inuit is Athabascan language family? I'm not, I'm not gonna try and guess. Fair enough. <laughs> I'm trying to remember 20-year-old coursework. That's mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's the thing about it with the subtitles. You know, like if you're playing a oh, game yeah, that's in rope German rope. or yeah. Swedish or whatever, even even in you know Swedish, right? Every once in a while, there's you catch a word and you're like, you see it yeah. in the subtitle. Like, yeah, okay. There's no pairing here. Right. right? You're, yeah. You're, you'd be hard pressed. It's so distinct. The to, language. Yeah. Mm. Enemies, maybe? Mm. Troublemakers of some kind, that's for sure. All right. Where's your checkpoint? Nice. There we go. Oh, that's not checkpoints. That's just where you add, you earn new videos. Oh. Here we go. Damn. Yeah, the other thing this is reminding me of now, actually, especially with the two different figures and um, sort of needing to solve puzzles, is the cave, which uh, I regularly play with Crystalie Malone when she has me do a guest spot in her uh, class at Madison. Um, and there are all these kind of archetypical figures. There's a scientist, there's a knight, there's a farmer, there's all these different people. And you're going through a cave and it's very similar to these moments in this game right now where you, you need to jump back and forth between different characters to do different things. Although you can multiply like this one can too, right? And then you, you're both each controlling one. I wonder if there will ever be a third. I know they're working on a sequel. I meant like a third, whether we'll character. ever get a third oh, character in, to in control. This game, in, in the cave, you can have three or four even, I think. So it's very reminiscent of like the top-down isometric games um, from like D and D Ooh, or okay. Marble Avenue. Oh, you weren't Poor controlling fox. the fox. That's unfortunate. Um, oh, it doesn't always throw oh. to the same spot either. It probably Wait. throws to where you were. Yeah. Standing. So you're playing this multiplayer. It's two people. Oh, get room. you to throw it on the other end to weight it down. Yeah. There we go. I think it's side by side. So yeah. you're, you're sitting with each other with different controls. Yeah. 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 I was thinking the, the, the style of it too. It almost reminds me of that. Um, it's a really simple name, but I'm not going to think of it. Did you get the drum? Yep. Oh, You're playing in like this back. really sandy environment. And it's oh, Constance um, Steinkuhler talks about it a lot. Is it one? Journey? No. Journey, Journey, yeah, where you don't realize necessarily at first. Well, right. now you do. Initially, you didn't realize that it was a multiplayer game until you started noticing these little patterns. Right? Right. But in this similar way, the two characters are playing off each other, right? You have to rely on each other's abilities and move, right? All right. It'd be an interesting challenge to play. Know, multiplayer, but not communicate. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, th it reminds Sitting. me. It reminds me a little bit of a game called The Way, um, which is uh, an online. I think it was. I forget if it was Flash or not, so I'm not sure if you can still play it. But it was. It was a game where you got randomly paired with someone else who was playing it online. Right. No, there's no audio interface or anything. You can. Mm -hmm do so it's just you are on the top screen and your partner's on the bottom screen or vice versa and you have to do basically you're in different areas for like the whole first half of the game where you have to like collaborate to you know push boxes down to the next level or you know hit switches or whatever and then the second half of the game is then where you're like together in the same room and have to complete puzzles together all without you know speaking and you can signal and you can you know use i think you're um you can do like whistles or something to like help direct your partner but it's like something where you have to rely on another person without speaking to them in order to like make it through that kind of um 
in a way, like, it's almost kind of nicer than working with a person, like, right next to you, because then you can't get mad at them as easily. Because <laughs> you have constraints, so you're like, I can yeah, understand why, they, do why right. they don't understand what I'm doing. Attenuated channels. The lack of bandwidth can be productive, right? It's data to noise. It makes me wonder, you know, like, what is the preferred way, the, the, the intent of how this game should be? Because, like, I get the sense that, like, the, your ability right now to play as both is just because then, otherwise people wouldn't. You couldn't play right. without other people. Well, if someone would like to take my spot and take take over for the fox, you should feel free to do that. I'm analog, man. <laughs> okay, so that's the path. Okay. Oh. There we go. Cool. Do that to unlock. There's the right spot. Cool, cool, cool. I and cannot get over this. The, the aesthetic of this. Like, mm. it's, yeah, it's just so beautiful. Every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, wow. Um, also, viewers, we are watching chat, so feel free to comment. You know, it's interesting to think about games that also make use of a kind of spare, you know, spare audio scape spare palette things like hollow knight you know and things like that or uh what is it ori and the uh, and the blind forest and the blind forest and mm. but they 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 put themselves forward as i mean maybe i don't know maybe i'm ignorant of, of certain things but they, I, I gather that those kinds of games put themselves forward as original in their aesthetic right like mm -hmm. it like it's even though i'm sure there are influence of course i think it's truly original it's presented as this kind of, hey, look at, you know, this point of view from an artist, right? Whereas here I'm getting a very similar feeling aesthetically. There's a number of those games, but of course you, you, you're you very aware of the fact that this is, a, you know, an encumbered history of, of the aesthetic of it. You know, it comes from a certain point of view. And I maybe that's, maybe that makes it richer to me. Certainly sets the mood in a different way, right? Like Doom 3 was kind of the first game that didn't have like a score like mm -hmm. the sound the the audio track was like walking around a space station and monsters. Right. there was no music behind it right and it set that like chilling horror score in a much more substantial way than like right. relying on like cymbal crashes Oops. for um you know jump scares with him yeah oh yeah you gotta throw it at that there we go Wow, that took me way longer than it should have. The, I just the forgot. The glowing blue is the <laughs> is the kind of sign, right? I just completely forgot how to do that. Um, even though I did it five seconds before coming <laughs> upon that, right? Oh, that reminds me though. It's like, oh, this just reminds me of of teaching in a way, um, right? Where you you teach someone to do something, and then not even you know, five seconds later, they're doing something very similar, but just in a slightly different context. And it's so easy just to completely forget everything that you just did. Right. <laughs> right. Um, even though it seems pretty, pretty apparent what you should do to an outside observer, sometimes it's just like your brain is not. Well, we've been having a discussion on Discord about the differences between Latour and Bourdieu and that what you just reported, David, would support Bourdieu over Latour. The tour has this idea. Well, we just we just pick and choose all these little influences, and then they're they're like plugins. They're ready at hand. And for Bourdieu, wait a second. You know, it's there are certain habits that are stickier. You know, mm -hmm. and, and so there's a resistance, a conservative kind of quality in our our way of being in the world. We don't just grab anything that's useful just because we're exposed to it. And and you know, the even if you want to can see that rationality somehow exists we're not rational in our decision making at at all times you know it's also like a common um critique of mobile gaming is that the tutorialing is bad it's just like mm. um like read these seven pages and mm. apply those systems mm -hmm. and so despite your uh lack of engaging with the tutorial in the way it was probably intended it's a much better design than it would have been if it was if it was just like look in your journal to figure out how to use a bullet. Mm -hmm. mm. It's 
Can you run and jump to make that, I wonder? Mm, maybe. Or we use the wind. You're supposed to use the wind. Oh, there we go. Um, there we go. <laughs> can she, can she, can she, she's got to be able to yeah. catch on. Yeah. yeah. Oops. Uh. <laughs> ah! <laughs> you probably have to land on yeah. the swan to keep it there. Swan? Loom. Hey, loom. loom. All right, let's try this again. There you go, dissing Minnesota again. You did it. Yeah. <laughs> It's just my own personal rivalry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Around my house we call it Minnesota God's Country. <laughs> Tongue in cheek, but yeah. They say that around her folks' places as well. <laughs> <laughs> Oop, so there's Ooh, a guy. Now we actually see them Oof. fully animated. Shoot, thing. shoot, shoot. I have a large appreciation for Minnesota despite my constant <laughs> Fair enough. Get that bowl already. Yep. <laughs> uh, come on, come on. Now can you put the ice back? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, come on. Uh, come on. Oh, wait. Uh, nope. uh, oh. <laughs> this is why I can't do video games. It's like, it's like I can see it. My hands, they don't do it. Your hands would be better at it if you played more video games. Yeah, I can't. I was fortunate to have a mother who appreciated the concept of hand eye coordination. <laughs> I feel like all the stuff I did learning play musical instruments, piano. Oh, and absolutely. Bass, definitely oh, played a huge role in my ability to play these games yeah. until my age got the better of me. As on, my, <sighs> on my British yes. panel shows, they talk about how people have like 11 senses rather than five. Mm. And one of them is like kinesi... Kinesthetics? No. Well, kine visual kines kinesthetics where like... You yeah, right. Where your body is. Oh, proprioception. Too, too, is something it's yeah. called, right? Yeah. Or, you know, like the test they do, you know, the cops have you yeah. do and touch your nose. Yeah, it's like knowing where your body is in space in relationship to. Right, so that's how you can, you know, weave your way through a crowded supermarket. Always rewarding, um, you know, reading for a casual reading for the academic over like a holiday break or whatever is like Oliver um, Sachs. Uh, like a man who mistook yeah. his wife for a hat. You learn a lot about this kind of stuff in, from him. Oop. Ooh, was what he wants. Yeah. Shoot. Uh, come on. Yeah. Oh. So close. Oh, did you? No, no you... I did not. Oh, he got me. See, this reminds me a little bit of Ori in the Blind Forest because at a lot at the end of a lot of levels um, in that game, there's this kind of chase sequence and it becomes a really big like spectacle kind of thing, right? So there's one where like you you finish a dungeon, right, and then the whole thing's like flooding with water and you have to use your newfound ability oh. to like. something to be said here there's a, um, a critique of games right now that uh is frustrated at the notion of the villains always being like large and deformed and yeah. mm -hmm. there might be a critique to be made about mm -hmm. the big man who burnt down the village <laughs> with the disgusting nose hair and the teeth and yeah. the yeah with the very like wario look yeah well as with many things we you know we could probably do better if we consider Miyazaki, right? Like he, mm -hmm. he, he is always pushing against those kinds of easy associations. There's never really a villain in his yeah. movies. 
But but I, I was gonna say those chase sequences sometimes are uh, events in the acad. Uh, I I wonder how we can think about them as being like contiguous with, but also distinct from you know everything else that happens. Because for the vast majority of the time, right, we're not on a timer. Mm -hmm. Um. Sounds like there's some liminality involved in those chase maybe. sequences. <laughs> but also they can because be very like spectacular right they're a, a mm. way of kind of taking you out from the rhythm and the tempo of the normal game and then it pushes you into some different form of play for a hot second there were these birds in the background and I thought they were going to like hook forward and like enter the plane where you're playing yeah it, I'm again reminded of Little Big Planet thinking about that contrast we were just talking about you know that the first time in Little Big Planet, there was this kind of steamroller mechanic where something is coming from the left side of the screen and you just have to keep moving. It was a shock. The game is a different game after that because you realize that's possible. That that may be what you have to contend with at any moment, and that's true here too. But it does so in a way that doesn't feel out of place, right? Like so many games have those like, for lack of a better word, mini game esque like mechanics to them that are mm -hmm. distracting from the overall experience right that's got to be the a, a big de design challenge right yeah. how do you how do you do that without it being clunky and um, and disrupting like a, the like the, right. the gameplay or narrative Ooh. uh oh speaking of which <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, I'm, I was guessing that didn't work I feel like these these kinds of sequences are also hard to, to program because you always need to be able. Well, to, fish. Ooh. Yeah, this is wild. There's so much going on on screen. You also need to be able to like have that constant fear of danger, right? Because if it if it was just a chase and you could really get as far ahead as you wanted to, right? You could really just kind of practice the level and then not really have any form of danger. The gating is important. Here. That is not what I... I was expecting it to <laughs> be like I, before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, can you touch it and come back? Jump jump right back? No. Oh. Okay. Apparently not. Just gotta figure out something else. Maybe, maybe I have to bullet. throw... Yeah, maybe I have to throw it somehow. Like a... Fetch. <laughs> no, throw it at the ice, though. Oh. Oh. Yeah, you did it. Oh no, you're oh. fine. Oh wait. Shoot, we were fine. Jump the gun. Yeah, I think the fish are gonna carry you. Yep. It's interesting that it's taken this long to have like a violence component to your character. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. And that's kinda why I thought, you know, I I wasn't going to hit the bear. But I mean it's not like I killed it, right? Or sure, I really right. hurt it at all. I just kinda like bonked it on the head. But by and large, it really hasn't been any attack to this game. Attack the game. Yeah, it's oh, more so been about avoiding, right? Here we go. Classic. Oh, classic. Yep. Reminds me of Galaxy Quest, that wonderful scene in Galaxy Quest where Sigourney Weaver is in the in the engine room. And there's like all these things like crushing for no reason. Like, this episode was badly written. <laughs> <laughs> it's an 
upside down wall. Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. Can you bug your turn? I'm glad it didn't try oh. to force it to follow you yeah. because you were going. I like how he just plods along. Ooh, something up there. A secret. Yeah. Oops. No. Oh. No. Oh. oh. That Ooh. was a little gruesome. <laughs> that was. <laughs> I, I don't think that's what the. A little bit uh, of a rag doll effect. Yeah, I don't think that's what was supposed to happen. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting to, to see this mechanic. I'm sure it must be in other games too, but you know, obviously, the, the famous ones are like the Mario ones and stuff, oh right? Oh gosh. Uh, like we're talking about. But here, it's the motion of the waves mm -hmm. that, which actually, in some ways, is less arbitrary. Right, right. You know, right. As, a, a, as a narrative, the there's a reason for it. That is the way, you know, ocean water can. Rather move. than like your platform is bobbing in there. Lava yeah. or something. Uh. Oh no! Did you get a boost from that jump? Yeah, I got a little boost cool. from it. But now I got the thing that. Yeah. So I don't need it. Ooh, gonna go for it. Yep. Did you look a little more like teeth than I thought you were? Got to think about teeth. No, it's just... All right. Oh. Ooh, I got this. Oof. Probably need to switch back. Wailing and gnashing of teeth. Wailing yeah. versus yeah, wailing. wailing. Yeah, it's nice <laughs> to have you down here. Those guys, my dad jokes, you know, I know they're going to be picked up on. Right, I'm guessing there's something up here. <laughs> this reminds me a little bit of um of Resident Evil, which has a penchant for putting you in tight spaces with mm. with big monsters. And that's always like the most nerve wracking to me. It's convenient with the camera. Oh. The shelf is just far enough away that the camera can get the whole you know, circle there. How does that help? Oh, oh I see. Uh, hmm. Careful, careful. Oh, shoot. Oh, at least they gave you that progress. No, th I think they do those. Okay. Oh, now you're not going to be able to do the thing. Beep. Ah. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see how platformers are being used. Recent gaming, so I think of like Celeste, that's just like a parable for like depression. Mm -hmm. um, go, go, go. With like the, the kind of applied uh, use of platforms. Really oh, speaking of a whale, right. speaking of a whale. 
As long as it's not just a skin. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's not just Mario with, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. Right. material. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that might, we're coming up on one. That might yeah. be a good place to, yeah. to end it. I think it's a gorgeous, gorgeous game. Oh. So, well, It's like a right whale. And I heard recently the right whales are in big trouble right now. Oh, jeez. What's a right whale? Gee, I wonder why they didn't drown. Was it a wrong whale or a left yeah. whale? Actually, I think it got its name because it was the right one to target because it had the, the best oh. whale oil or the you know the high proportion or something. I, I may not be remembering that correctly, but I think that is how, where the name comes from. Ooh. All right. We're going to... I think we're going to call it there. I don't know about y'all, but I, I kind of want to play it again next week. Yeah, yeah I, I think we play should. It it's week. gorgeous. It is awesome. So we will plumb the depths of the, uh, the whale I see what you week. did there. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today for Lunch Zone. Um, and we'll see you next week at noon to play some more of Never Alone. Bye, everybody. Bye. See ya.